Hey everyone, welcome back for another deep dive with us. It's great to be here. Today we're going to be uh, really cracking open this fascinating world of veterinary neurology. Oh yes. It's a topic I know a lot of our listeners have been really wanting to explore more deeply with us. Um, and specifically, we're going to be looking at how vets diagnose epilepsy in dogs. We're going to be focusing on the technical side of things uh, with a focus on electroencephalography or EEG. EEG. Exactly. So think of EEG like uh, like getting a glimpse into the electrical activity happening in your dog's brain. Yeah. It's like tuning into the brain's communication network, you know, seeing all those tiny electrical signals firing between neurons. I love that. The source material for our deep dive today is this super fascinating research article from the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Uh, it's called Use of Sedation Awakening Electroencephalography in Dogs with Epilepsy. Wow. And this article, it introduces a brand new protocol for how we perform EEGs on dogs, and the results are really exciting. They are. What's really interesting here is that traditionally, sedation has been the standard for, you know, canine EEGs. Right. But as you can imagine, sedation can sometimes mask some of the really subtle brainwave patterns right. that might actually indicate epilepsy. So the study's trying to address that. So let's get to the heart of the matter here. Mm -hmm. Can this new sedation awakening protocol actually improve the detection of epileptic activity in dogs? Yeah. Compared to just sedating them, that is the core question they set out to answer. And to understand why this is such a big deal, you have to think about the challenges of, you know, traditional EEG in dogs. Dogs aren't exactly known for staying perfectly still. Right. Especially with electrodes attached to their heads. Yeah, that makes sense. Ah. So sedation obviously helps minimize all those movements that can interfere with the readings. But like you said, it could also be hiding those important epileptic signals. So it's a real balancing act. Exactly. So this study had three groups of dogs to compare. <laughs> They had a control group of healthy dogs uh, sedated with metatomidine, and then a group of dogs with epilepsy, okay. also sedated with metatomidine, uh, yeah. and finally a group of dogs with epilepsy who were given metatomidine, but then also received a tipamizole, okay. which is a reversal agent to wake them up partway through the EEG. Okay, so the third group is where it gets really interesting. They're basically going from sleepy to alert during the recording. Yeah. So I'm guessing the researchers were looking for those telltale signs of epilepsy. Yes. Those little bursts of electrical activity, those epileptiform discharges or EDs. Yes. You yeah. got it. They were specifically looking for those EDs, which are kind of like little fingerprints of a seizure. Okay. And here's where it gets really interesting. Okay. The dogs who were woken up partway through that sedation awakening group, they showed a significantly higher number of EDs wow. compared to both the control group and the epileptic dogs who were only sedated. Wow. That's a remarkable finding. Yeah. So waking them up seems to make those epileptic signals much easier to spot. Does the study give any specific examples of the types of EDs they found? Absolutely. They identified uh, several different types of EDs, things like spikes, poly spikes and sharp waves, which are all characteristic of epileptic activity. You can actually see visual representations of these patterns oh, cool. in figures eight and nine of the study. And they even use specific terminology like spike and wave complexes and sharp and slow wave complexes. Wow. So it sounds like the study went pretty deep into the nitty gritty of these signals. Yeah. But practically speaking, why is this discovery so exciting? What does it mean for dogs with epilepsy? Well, the implications are huge. This sedation awakening protocol could lead to much more accurate diagnoses for dogs that are suspected of having epilepsy. And earlier, more accurate diagnoses can lead to more effective treatment plans, you know, which can really improve the lives of both the dogs and their owners. I can see why you're so excited about this. Yeah. But I'm guessing there are some challenges with this protocol, right? I remember reading something about artifacts in the study. You are right. One challenge is that the sedation awakening group did have a higher number of what we call movement artifacts in their EEGs. Okay. These are just little blips uh, caused by muscle twitches or movements. Okay. And they can sometimes be mistaken for actual brain activity. So how do you tell the difference between a true epileptic signal and just a dog shifting around? during the EEG. Well, that's where the skill and experience of the veterinary neurologist really comes in. Right. They're trained to analyze those readings very carefully 
taking into account things like the shape, the frequency, the location of the signals to make sure they're interpreting them correctly. And they also use video recordings of the dog during the EEG to help distinguish those artifacts from real EDs. It's like having a detective's eye, you know, right. <laughs> for those little electrical whispers in the brain. Yeah. They can spot those subtle clues that could point to epilepsy. So it's not just about the technology, yeah. but also about having a skilled interpreter. Right. Someone who can decipher the language of the brain. Precisely. That's why it's so important to have these EEGs interpreted by a qualified veterinary neurologist. Right. They have that training and experience to separate the real signals from the noise. Okay. That makes total sense. Yeah. But going back to the study for a second, you mentioned that the timing of the atipomazole, the reversal agent, yes. seemed to be crucial. Yeah. Why is that? Great question. The researchers wanted to make sure they captured both the sedated and the awakening states. Okay. So they waited five minutes after starting the EEG recording yeah. before they gave the atipomizole. Okay. This gave them a clear picture of the brain activity under sedation first. Right. And then they could see how things changed as the dog became more alert. That's smart. Yeah. They're basically creating a controlled transition yeah. to see if anything interesting emerges as the dog wakes up. Exactly. And remember, they saw that significant increase in EDs in that sedation awakening group during that second phase of the recording. Right. Right after the dog started waking up. Yeah. It's almost like the transition itself triggers those epileptic signals. Right. Wow. That's fascinating. Uh, so it's not just about detecting more EDs, yes. but also about potentially understanding what might be triggering them. Right. Could this lead to insights into how to better manage epilepsy in dogs? That's the burning question. <laughs> this yeah. study is just the first step. Right. But it opens up some really exciting possibilities for future research. Imagine being able to pinpoint specific triggers, whether it's stress, certain environments, yeah. or even specific times of day. That kind of knowledge could really revolutionize how we approach treatment. It's like unlocking a whole new level of personalized care for dogs with epilepsy. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked a lot about the potential benefits of this sedation awakening protocol. Yeah. But what about the limitations? We've touched on the issue of movement, artifacts, right. or anything else. Well, the main limitation, as with any initial study, is that it was relatively small. Okay. They only had a limited number of dogs in each group. To really confirm these findings and see how well this protocol works in different breeds, ages, and types of epilepsy, we need larger and more diverse studies. So more research is needed to see how widely applicable this protocol could be. That makes sense. Mm. But even with those limitations, yeah, this research seems to be a significant step forward in how we diagnose epilepsy in dogs. I agree. It's a very promising development, and it has the potential to really improve the lives of dogs and their families. Now, I'm a bit curious about some of the technical details of the study. Sure. You mentioned that they use something called subdermal wire electrodes, or SWEs. Yes. What are those, and why did they choose them over the more traditional cup electrodes? So cup electrodes are those little metal discs that you often see in human EEGs. Right. But they can be really tricky to use on dogs, especially when they're awake and moving around because yeah. they can become dislodged. Yeah. SWEs, on the other hand, are tiny wires that are inserted under the skin, okay. making them much more stable and less likely to cause interference in the recordings. So it's all about getting the clearest signal possible. Makes sense. Right. The study also mentions that they used a specific placement for these electrodes, something called the International 1020 system. Can you explain what that is? Sure. The International 1020 system is basically a standardized method for placing EEG electrodes on the scalp. Okay. It's based on specific anatomical landmarks on the head, like the nation, the bridge of the nose, yeah, and right. the inion, the bump at the back of the head, okay. to ensure consistency and accuracy in the recordings. So it's like a universal map for the brain. Yeah. Ensuring that researchers are all looking at the same areas. I guess that's crucial for comparing results across different studies. Exactly. And this standardization is especially important in veterinary medicine. Right. Where we have all those different head shapes and sizes to contend with. Okay. That makes sense. Now, going back to the findings you mentioned, they observed various types of EVs. Yes like spikes, poly spikes, and sharp waves. Yeah. Did they find any differences in these patterns between the different groups of dogs? That's a really interesting question. While they described the different ED types yeah. and provided those visual examples in the figures, right. the study didn't really dive deep into any potential differences in ED patterns between the groups. Okay. Their primary focus was on the overall 
presence and frequency of EDs. Got it. Not necessarily on subtle variations in their shapes or characteristics. So there's still a lot more we could learn about these different ED patterns. Oh, yeah. And what they might tell us about the nature of the epilepsy. Absolutely. There's so much more to explore in this area. Right. For example, future research could investigate whether certain ED patterns are associated with different types of seizures, Very different cool. breeds, or even different responses to treatment. That's exciting. It seems like this study has opened up a whole new world of possibilities for understanding and treating canine epilepsy. I agree. And the more we understand, the better equipped we'll be to help these dogs live longer, healthier, and happier lives. Okay, I want to touch on something that came up earlier. You mentioned that the study found a higher number of movement artifacts. Yes. In the sedation awakening group. Mm -hmm. Were there any specific types of artifacts they observed? They specifically highlighted electromyographic artifacts or EMG artifacts, which yeah. are caused by muscle activity. These can show up as high frequency noise on the EEG recording, right. and they can sometimes be tricky to distinguish from actual brain activity. So how do veterinary neurologists differentiate between those artifacts mm. and true epileptic activity? It involves a combination of careful observation experience and using additional tools. Okay. First, they visually inspect the EEG tracing, okay. looking for telltale signs of muscle activity, like rhythmic bursts of high-frequency waves. So they're looking for patterns that are typical of muscle movement rather than brain waves. Exactly. And they're also looking at the context of those signals. Okay. For example, if they see a burst of high-frequency activity that coincides with the dog moving its head or legs, yeah. they can be fairly confident that it's an EMG artifact rather than a true ED. That makes sense. It's all about piecing together the crews. Yeah. But what about those cases where it's not so obvious? That's where experience comes in. Veterinary neurologists have seen countless EEGs. Right. So they have a keen eye for recognizing subtle differences between brain activity and artifacts. They've developed a kind of sixth sense for it. It's amazing how the human brain can be trained to spot those patterns. Yeah. But you mentioned additional tools. What are those? One of the most helpful tools is video recording. Yeah. Oh. Many veterinary neurology labs now record the dog during the EEG, okay. which allows them to see exactly what the dog is doing at any given point in the recording. This can be incredibly helpful in identifying movement artifacts. So if they see a spike on the EEG and then look at the video and see the dog twitching its ear at the exact same time, they know it's probably an artifact. Exactly. The video provides invaluable context right. and helps to confirm their suspicions. That's really clever. Mm -hmm. It seems like technology is constantly evolving to help us understand the brain better. It definitely is. And these advancements are making a real difference in the lives of animals. Okay, one last question about the artifacts. Yeah. Did the study mention anything about how they dealt with those EMG artifacts in their analysis? Yeah. Do they try to filter them out or minimize them in any way? They did mention that they used a combination of visual inspection and digital filtering techniques to minimize the impact of artifacts on their analysis. Okay. They didn't go into great detail about the specific filtering methods. Right. But they emphasized the importance of carefully identifying and accounting for artifacts to ensure accurate interpretation of the EEG results. So they took steps to clean up the data, so to speak. Right. To make sure they were only analyzing the true brain signal. Exactly. And that's a crucial part of of any EEG analysis, right. whether it's in humans or animals. Okay, I think that covers the artifacts pretty thoroughly. Yeah. Now I'm curious about the drugs they used in the study. You mentioned metatomidine for sedation and atipomazole as, as the reversal agent. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about those drugs and why they were chosen for this study? Sure. Metatomidine is a sedative that's commonly used in veterinary medicine. Okay. It's known for its reliable effects. Yeah. Relatively short duration of action. Right. And minimal impact on brain activity. Right. Which is crucial for EEG recording. So it calms the dog down without overly suppressing brainwave activity. That makes sense. Right. What about atipomazole? Atipomazole is specifically designed to reverse the effects of metatomidine. Oh. Okay. It binds to the same receptors in the brain, okay. blocking the effects of metomidine and allowing the dog to wake up quickly and predictably. So it's like an antidote to the sedative. Exactly. And that's why this combination is so appealing for the sedation awakening protocol. Right. It allows for that controlled transition between the sedated and awake states, right. making it easier to observe changes in brain activity. It's like having a precise on-off switch for the sedation. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, I'm curious about the dogs themselves. 
Did the study mention anything about the specific types of epilepsy they were looking at? They actually included a mix of dogs with different types of epilepsy. Okay. Including both idiopathic epilepsy, which means the cause is unknown, right. and structural epilepsy, which is caused by a specific abnormality in the brain, like a tumor or scar tissue. So they weren't focusing on any particular subtype of epilepsy. That's right. Their main goal was to see if this new protocol could improve the detection of EDs in dogs with epilepsy in general, okay. regardless of the underlying cause. So potentially this protocol could be useful for a wide range of canine epilepsy cases. That's the hope. But as we discussed earlier, more research is needed to confirm that. Of course. Okay, shifting gears a bit, I'm curious about the practical implications of this study for dog owners. Sure. If this sedation awakening protocol becomes more widely adopted, what should dog owners know about it? That's a great question. I think the biggest takeaway for dog owners is that this protocol could potentially lead to earlier and more accurate diagnoses of epilepsy in their dogs. Okay. And with a more accurate diagnosis comes a better chance of finding the right treatment. Right. And improving the dog's quality of life. So it's all about giving dogs with epilepsy the best possible chance at a healthy and happy life. Exactly. And this new protocol could be a big step in that direction. I'm really excited about the possibilities. This has been such an eye-opening deep dive into the world of veterinary neurology. It's been a pleasure sharing this information with you. Okay, before we wrap things up, I want to touch on one more aspect of the study. I noticed they mentioned some limitations in their discussion section. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about what those limitations were and what they might mean for the interpretation of the results? Sure. One of the main limitations they highlighted was the small sample size, as we discussed earlier. Right. They only had a limited number of dogs in each group which means that the results might not be generalizable to all dogs with epilepsy. So larger studies are needed to confirm whether these findings hold true for a wider population of dogs. Exactly. Another limitation they mentioned was the potential for bias in the selection of dogs for the study. Okay. The dogs were all recruited from a single veterinary referral hospital. Right. Which means that they might not be representative of the general dog population with epilepsy. So there's a chance that the dogs in the study were more likely to have certain characteristics yeah. or types of epilepsy, right. which could have influenced the results. That's right. It's important to keep that in mind when interpreting the findings. Okay, that makes sense. Any other limitations they mentioned? They also acknowledged that the sedation awakening protocol is more time consuming and labor intensive okay. than traditional sedated EEG. Okay. It requires more careful monitoring of the dog, right. more precise timing of the drug administration, okay. and more expertise in interpreting the results. So it's not just a simple switch that every veterinary clinic can implement overnight. Right. It requires specialized training and resources. Exactly. And that's something that needs to be considered as this protocol is further evaluated. Right. And potentially adopted by more veterinary neurology practices. Okay. I think that covers the limitations pretty well. Yeah. Now, before we move on to the final part of our deep dive, okay. I want to circle back to one of the most exciting aspects of this study. Yeah. You mentioned that this research could potentially help us identify triggers for epileptic seizures. Right. Can you elaborate on that a bit more? Sure. One of the most challenging aspects of managing epilepsy in dogs is that we often don't know what triggers their seizures. Yeah. It can be incredibly frustrating for both the dog and the owner right. to experience these unpredictable episodes. It's like trying to solve a mystery without any clues. Exactly. But this new sedation awakening protocol could provide some of those missing clues okay. by observing the dogs as they transition from a sedated state to an awake state, we might be able to identify specific changes in brain activity or behavior okay. that precede a seizure. So like creating a more dynamic picture of what's happening in the brain. Yes. Rather than just a static snapshot. Precisely. And that dynamic picture could reveal subtle patterns or triggers okay. that we might have missed with traditional sedated EEG. Right. For example, we might see that a dog's brain activity starts to change in a particular way when they're exposed to a certain type of light or sound huh? or when they experience a sudden change in their environment. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's like we're opening up a whole new window into the world of canine epilepsy. I agree. And this new understanding could lead to more targeted and effective treatment strategies. Okay, I'm getting really excited about the possibilities. Yeah. I have a feeling this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding the complexities of canine epilepsy. 
I completely agree. And the more we learn, the better equipped we are to help these amazing animals live their best lives, free from the fear and disruption of seizures. It's truly a testament to the dedication and ingenuity of veterinary researchers. Yes. They're constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible, and this sedation awakening protocol is a perfect example of that. Absolutely. It's a clever approach that utilizes existing knowledge about canine physiology and pharmacology to enhance our diagnostic capabilities. And the fact that it relies on readily available drugs yeah. and a relatively straightforward procedure makes it all the more impactful. And we it are... has the potential to become a standard of care in veterinary neurology. I think so too. It's okay. a real game changer for both dogs and their owners. Okay, before we wrap up, I wanna circle back to something we touched on earlier, the importance of interpreting EEG results carefully. Yeah. You mentioned that it requires a trained eye and a deep understanding of canine neurology. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure, EEGs are incredibly complex recordings. Right. Like with a lot of information packed into those squiggly lines. Yeah. It takes a skilled veterinary neurologist to sift through all that data, differentiate between normal brain activity artifacts and true epileptic discharges. Yeah. And then put it all together to make a diagnosis. So it's not just about spotting those telltale spikes or sharp waves. No, it's much more nuanced than that. Okay. Veterinary neurologists consider the frequency, right. the duration, mm -hmm. the location, and the morphology of the EEG signals, yeah. along with the dog's clinical history and neurological examination findings, right. to arrive at a comprehensive diagnosis. It's like putting together a puzzle. Uh huh. With the EEG as one of the key pieces. Exactly. And it's a puzzle that requires specialized training and experience to solve correctly. So for our listeners out there who might be concerned about their dog's neurological health, yes. what's the takeaway message? If your dog is exhibiting any signs of seizures or other neurological issues, yeah. don't hesitate to consult with your veterinarian. Thanks. They can assess your dog's condition and, if necessary, refer you to a board-certified veterinary neurologist for further evaluation. Early detection and diagnosis are key when it comes to managing epilepsy and other neurological conditions. Absolutely. The sooner we can identify the issue, the better the chances of achieving a positive outcome for your furry friend. Yeah, it really feels like we're on the cusp of some major breakthroughs in veterinary neurology. I agree. And it's not just about the technology itself. It's about how we use it to ask the right questions and, you know, gain a deeper understanding of these complex conditions. Speaking of asking the right questions, let's uh, shift gears for a moment and think about the bigger picture. This sedation awakening protocol seems really promising, but where do we go from here? What are the next steps in this line of research? That's the crux of the matter. Well, first and foremost, we need more research larger studies with more diverse groups of dogs. Right. This will help us confirm, you know, those initial findings and see how well this protocol works across, you know, different breeds, ages, types of epilepsy. So it's all about validating these results on a larger scale. Makes sense. Exactly. We also need to explore the potential of this protocol beyond just diagnosis. Could it be used to monitor treatment effectiveness? Right. Could it help us predict seizures or identify specific triggers? Right. These are all questions that future research could address. That's exciting. So this one study has really opened up a whole new avenue of possibilities for understanding and managing canine epilepsy. Absolutely. And the more we learn, the better we can tailor treatment plans to individual dogs. Right. Giving them the best possible chance at a seizure-free life. It's like we're moving towards personalized medicine for our furry friends. <laughs> okay. Before we wrap up our deep dive, I want to touch on one more thing that really struck me about this study. Yeah. They really emphasize the importance of you know, proper electrode placement and really securing those electrodes, especially in that sedation awakening group. Right. Why is that so crucial? That's a great point. You have to remember, even the slightest movement can create artifacts in that EEG recording. Those little blips of electrical activity that can be mistaken for brain waves. So making sure those electrodes are nice and snug and secure is essential for getting clean, reliable data especially when the dog is transitioning between states of consciousness. It's all about minimizing those pesky artifacts that can really cloud the picture. Exactly. And the researchers in this study took that very seriously. They even provided detailed instructions in their methods section on how to prepare the skin, insert the electrodes, secure them with surgical glue. Wow. So they really wanted to make sure other researchers could replicate their protocol accurately. Absolutely. 
And that attention to detail is one of the reasons the study is so valuable. It lays the groundwork for future research and helps ensure that the results are reliable and meaningful. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So for our listeners out there who might be considering having an EEG done on their dog, what should they know about this new protocol and what questions should they ask their vet? First and foremost, if you notice any signs of seizures or other neurological issues in your dog, don't hesitate to talk to your vet. They can assess your dog's condition and, if necessary, refer you to a board-certified veterinary neurologist for further evaluation. When discussing EEG options, you can certainly ask your vet if they're familiar with this sedation awakening protocol and whether it might be appropriate for your dog. So it's important to be an advocate for your dog and ask questions. Absolutely. It's your right to understand the diagnostic options available and make informed decisions about your dog's health care. Well said. Yeah. Now, if a vet does recommend this sedation awakening EEG, what can a dog owner expect? It's very similar to a traditional EEG, but with that added step of waking the dog up partway through, yeah. the procedure itself involves placing those specialized electrodes, the SWEs we talked about, right. under the skin. It sounds a bit scary, yeah. but it's actually a relatively minor procedure done with local anesthesia. So it's not as invasive as it might sound at first. Exactly. And the benefits in terms of potentially getting a clearer picture of the brain's activity can outweigh any temporary discomfort. Okay, that's good to know. Any other advice for dog owners who might be going through this process? I think the most important thing is to communicate openly with your vet and the veterinary neurologist. Right. Ask questions, share any concerns you have, and make sure you understand the results of the EEG and what they mean for your dog's treatment plan. So it's all about teamwork and open communication. Exactly. Yeah. Working together, you and your veterinary team can give your dog the best possible care. This has been an absolutely fascinating deep dive. We've learned so much about the, you know, intricacies of canine brains, the challenges of diagnosing epilepsy, and the really exciting potential of this new sedation awakening protocol. I think our listeners are going to walk away with a whole new appreciation for the world of veterinary neurology. I hope so. It's a field that's constantly evolving, and there's so much more to discover. I can't wait to see what the future holds. And for our listeners out there, remember from Vet Neurojar, Keep those minds inspired hearts, light and tails wagging.